So hello, I'm Dr. Ahmed Hanani, a visiting lecturer here in the English Department at Royal Holloway, and I specialise in American literature and drama from 1900 to the present. Today I want to outline four strategies for you to teach William Faulkner's The Sand and the Fury under the following four headings. Narrative and fragmentation, tragedy, modernism and experimentation, and difficulty. So The Sand and the Fury is told through four contrasting narrative styles, which are typically referred to as sections across an 18-year time period, beginning in June 2nd, 1910, and ending on Easter weekend, April 6th, 7th and 8th, 1928. At the centre of each of these sections is a different narrative consciousness. The first three sections are told from the perspective of the, of the three Compson brothers, while the fi final section is told from the perspective of what is best described as Faulkner. Each narrative voice is antithetical to the other. So, for instance, the narrator of section 1, April 7th, 1928, is Benji Compson, the youngest Compson brother. Um, Benji is born of a mental disability and relates the downfall of the Compsons across 33 years, using various intersecting and often indistinguishable time shifts in order to do so. Faulkner once described Benji's narrative as his attempt to tell this story as it seemed to me that that idiot child saw it. And that idiot child, to me, didn't know what a question, what an interrogation was. He didn't know too much about grammar. He spoke only through his senses. The narrator of section 2, June 2nd, 1910, is Quentin Compson, the eldest Compson child and a 19-year-old Harvard un undergraduate. Quentin's section takes place on the day he intends to and ultimately succeeds in committing suicide. As such, his section reflects the disorder and chaos he experiences on the last day of his life. Faulkner explained the way that Quentin's section is written by describing him as a ha educated half madman, and so he dispensed with grammar. Because it was all clear to his half mad brain, and it seemed to him it would be clear to anybody else's brain that what he saw was quite logical, quite clear. Jason Compson IV narrates section 3, April 6, 1928. Of the three brothers, Jason is by far the one whose narrative voice and style is most straightforward. Nonetheless, Jason is a deeply problematic narrator and character because his voice and worldview is saturated with racism, sexism and misogyny. Faulkner once described Jason as completely inhuman, and I think his treatment of Dilsey, Luster, Miss Quentin, his contempt for his deceased father and brother, and so on, validates Faulkner's description. The final section of the novel, April 8th, 1928, is the only section that is not told in the first person singular, but is instead told from an ostensibly objective and omniscient narrative perspective, most commonly referred to as Faulkner, although some critics have also referred to the chapter as Dilsey's section. Faulkner explained uh, that his narrative style for that chapter was that since he originally envisaged the novel as being a short story entitled Twilight, he intended the story to be something that could be done in about two pages, a thousand words. I found out it couldn't. I finished it the first time and it wasn't right, so I wrote it again. Uh, and that was Quentin. That wasn't right. I wrote it again. That was Jason. That wasn't right. Then I tried to let Faulkner do it. That was still wrong. With these differing narrative styles at the heart of the novel, a useful class task or close reading exercise to set your students is to get them to compare and contrast one passage from Ben's use section to one from, for example, Quentin's. Get your students to highlight any similarities or differences that they notice between the two passages, uh, noting sentence, structure and length, clarity, articulacy, meaning and so on. Ask them why Faulkner goes to the lengths that he does to create these differences between the, two narr between the narrators and narrative voices. So moving on to tragedy. The novel's title comes from Act 5, Scene 5, uh, lines 19 to 28 of William Shakespeare's Macbeth. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now Faulkner actively acknowledged the link between Macbeth's soliloquy and the content of the novel, saying that the title, of course, came from the first section, which was Benji. 
I thought the story was told in Benji's section and the title came there. So it, in that sense, does apply to Benji rather than to anybody else, though the more I had to work on the book, the more elastic the novel, the title became, until it covered the whole family. Events, uh, tragic events abound in the novel. Caddy, the only Compton daughter, is, is exiled from her home and family after falling pregnant out of wedlock. Quentin commits suicide because of his unrequited sexual desires for Caddy. Benji is castrated. Jason Compton III, uh, the pessimistic family patriarch, drinks himself to death. Uh, and the family land uh, is sold and converted into a golf course to subsidize Quentin's ill-fated Harvard education. Where Caddy is concerned, the tragedy of the Compsons is predicated on their refusal uh, to accept the changes occurring in Southern society in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, particularly regarding female sexuality, race, the abolition of slavery, and the Great Northward Migration. By directly referencing Shakespearean tragedy in the title, Faulkner invokes a specific literary context and tradition in which to read the events which befall the Compsons, elevating the downfall of this family uh, to the status of canonical dramatic art. And apart from Benji and Macbeth, critics have highlighted connections and parallels to characters from other Shakespearean tragedies, such as Hamlet. In The Heart of Yokna Patafwa, published in 1981, John Pilkington reads Quentin as a Hamlet-type figure, while more recently, Erin E. Campbell in her essay Sad Generation Seeking Water, The Social Construction of Madness in Ophelia and Quentin Compson, reads uh, Quentin's suicide by drowning as a direct allusion to the death of Ophelia. So in order to get your students to appreciate the importance of Shakespeare upon the novel, I'd recommend setting them the task of writing an essay analysing the significance of Shakespearean tragedy upon the novel. The strategy works well for students who are reading, studying and analysing a Shakespeare play alongside their study of Faulkner and potentially creates extended comparative essay topics for their final major projects. Now in terms of historical and literary context, the novel emerges at the tail end of the 1920s, a decade defined by the innovation of European modernist writers such as James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Virginia Woolf, and D.H. Lawrence. In that same decade, American modernism converged rapidly with its European counterpart, thanks largely to the expatriate movement in Paris, where American writers such as Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Ernest Hemingway published groundbreaking examples of modernist literature, such as Hugh Selwyn Mowbray, Tender Buttons, The Great Gatsby, and The Sun Also Rises. So The Sound and the Fury, therefore, emerges from this modernist fervour uh, that is preoccupied with experimentation and innovation. In terms of the variety of narrative styles and time shift that I highlighted earlier, Faulkner's innovation is reflected in the form and content of the novel, particularly in Benji and Quentin's sections, both of which uh, interpolate various different voices and narrative perspectives to become what Roland Barthes in his essay The Death of the Author terms as a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centres of culture. In The Sound and the Fury, Faulkner is confronting issues of fragmentation, dislocation, mortality, morality, race and sexuality, building upon issues explored in works such as Joyce's Ulysses or Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises and in a manner which displays his consciousness of and indebtedness to not only Joyce's work, but also Eliot's The Wasteland. In order to enable your students to come to grips with the innovations and experimentations within the novel, you may find it useful to create, as a whole class, a timeline of the events which take place in the novel, beginning by charting events which occur in Benji's section, then branching out to discuss the events in Quentin's section and the events not explicitly seen in the novel. Not only will such a task be fun and enjoyable for your students, but it will also enable you to engage with and explore the minutia of events that occur in the work, which will then also help you to defang the notoriously confusing and bewildering nature of, the, of studying the novel for the first time. And speaking of that, I want to end today with a brief word about the novel's difficulty. Your students might find the novel difficult to read and impossible to comprehend, especially the first time that they read it. But rather than be worried or put off by this, I want to assure you that this is a perfectly acceptable and even expected reaction to have to the novel. The trick, however, is to recognise that difficulty is an intentional part 
uh, of the novel's design and indeed Faulkner's authorial and aesthetic method. Faulkner was all too well aware that his works were often considered to be needlessly complex and impenetrable. In his Paris Review interview with Jean Stein, Stein broached the, fo- the issue of Faulkner's difficulty directly, mentioning that some people say they can't understand your writing even after they read it two or three times. What approach would you suggest for them? Faulkner's response to Stein was the witty, though nonetheless serious, response for readers to read it four times. The Sand and the Fury therefore demands at least a second reading, during which what was initially difficult or obscure in the novel will hopefully reveal itself to your students. I sincerely hope your students enjoy uh, studying Sand and the Fury, and I thank you for listening to me today.